As the FDA prepares to review booster data from both Johnson & Johnson and Moderna this week, other clinical trials are studying the potential of mixing doses of two different vaccines. Some experts say mixing and matching doses may be an effective approach. But the director of immunology of the immunology program at the University of Pennsylvania, Dr. John Weary, is cautioning against this idea. So Dr. Weary is here to talk about, you know, why he feels the way he does about this. Thank you so much for joining us. I know that this was something that was happening in the UK. They were taking a look at whether or not mixing and ma ma mixing and matching uh, doses would be a good remedy for shortages. Can you explain why you think it's actually not a good idea to start mixing COVID vaccines just yet? Well, I just don't think we have enough data yet. So mixing and matching vaccines and vaccine platforms has been something that's been used for vaccinology for a long time, especially in the HIV field. Uh, we used to call this sort of heterologous uh, prime boosting. We're now calling it mixing and matching. It can be very effective. It can sort of train your immune system in new ways. Um, the issue here is we just don't have all the data and we don't wanna, we don't wanna mess this up. We have variants that we have to make sure we get coverage for. Uh, we have to make sure that we get good durability. And you know, this pandemic, uh, we've been making decisions all along without having all the information we'd really like to have just because we're doing this in real time. So I think we just need to wait till we get the data. We'll, we'll have data soon. We're doing trials uh, to understand mixing and matching and all the benefits and potential lack of benefits of doing that. So I just think it's a little bit too early. So as we mentioned, uh, the FDA and advisors will meet this week to discuss Moderna and Johnson & Johnson's booster vaccines. Um, what kind of immune response does their booster data show thus far? Yeah, um, this is really exciting and really important. We are seeing data from all three vaccine manufacturers about boosting and durability. We've seen this from Pfizer already. Uh, the data from Moderna actually looks also quite good. Um, the uh, boosting gives you an increase in antibodies. Those antibodies are, of course, the important thing that protects us. Uh, the difference between Moderna and Pfizer is that the Moderna data um, from the, the original two shots actually looks quite good. And so I think the question the FDA will be asking is, is there enough need for Moderna uh, for boosters to be required at this point? Now, that may differ depending on whether we're talking about people over 65 years old or immunocompromised populations or just the overall healthy population. For Johnson & Johnson, uh, the boost data looks really impressive. Um, their boosting gave a dramatic increase in protection, uh, increasing antibodies, and uh, looks quite strong. So that actually leads to my next question, which you may have already answered, which is about Moderna. And, you know, there are reports suggesting that there is a hesitancy to approve Moderna for a booster shot, but th it, it might be for a good reason. It might be because two shots are offering is offering enough protection. Is that kind of the primary reason? Yeah, I think so. The two things the FDA looks at, uh, primarily they look at safety data. Is it safe to give a booster? Are there any risks? Um, how do we balance that with the potential benefit? Um, so these vaccines are very safe. Despite some anecdotes we hear about in the news, the overall safety data on the mRNA vaccines is really quite good. Um, the second thing is, is there a need? Um, is there a need to expend uh, the resources to give people boosters and, and um, you know, require them or ask them or provided us an opportunity to do that? And right now, I think uh, what my understanding is, is that the need for Moderna isn't as clear as it was for Pfizer, perhaps because there's a little better durability of immune responses following Moderna um, uh, across a large number of people. So that's the question the FDA will be asking. What does the need look like? What will the benefit be of giving that boost to, uh, to people who receive Moderna as the primary vaccination? Now, of course, we don't have all the information. Like I said at the beginning, um, we're really trying to make these decisions in settings where we have only part of the information we'd like to have. And that's because it's very difficult to get all of the information that you need in real time. So it may be that a few months from now, uh, the situation is a little bit different as we see immunity changing and waning over time uh, after any of these vaccines. So doc, do you believe that there will come a, a point that we will be able to use these COVID vaccines interchangeably? I, I noted uh, recently that I got my flu vaccine um, and, uh, the, the nurse, which is actually here at CBS, where they're offering flu vaccines for employees, um, the nurse said to me, because I looked at the sheet that I sign, and I said, oh, what is the brand of this vaccine? And she, she explained to me, and she goes, you know, 
in all the years we've been doing this, no one has ever, ever asked us what the brand of flu vaccines uh, um, are, except this year, because people all of a sudden became aware that there was such a thing, that there are different flu vaccines. And she even said that some people come in requesting certain brands of vaccines for the flu because they prefer them. And that includes some doctors who prefer certain brands of vaccines for influenza over others. So the question is, can we see that world coming into focus later on um, with COVID-19? Absolutely. So a couple of things. So great that you're getting the flu vaccine at work. Um, I hope that, that people all get their flu vaccine and we do that. It's also great to, to know that people are really interested in which vaccines they're getting. The, the public awareness of some of these important scientific issues is really a great thing. And, and we should embrace that and try to provide as much information as possible. But yes, I, I think we will see a time when we're mixing and matching these coronavirus vaccines. There's a little bit of preliminary evidence out of the UK that mixing and matching might actually be a really positive thing in terms of the type of immune response and durability of the immune response that you may get. So I'm very, very hopeful that we'll get there. Um, I think that there's evidence from previous um, example types of vaccines in the HIV field, the malaria field, and others, the mixing and matching vaccine platforms, let's call it, the type that Johnson & Johnson uses versus the mRNA vaccines, can actually be quite beneficial in terms of uh, augmenting the immune response, getting better quality immune responses, and maybe better, better durability. Uh, we need the, the data and the evidence to make those decisions, but I'm hopeful that, that that's what it's going to show. You know, Doctor, uh, your re reaction to um, Vlad's question made me think, you know, finally sort of this is the time where what, at whatever dinner party you're at, people really want to hear about what you have to say and what you do for a living, which probably didn't happen quite as often in previous years. But I also think everyone thinks they're an expert. Um, and they think they understand, uh, you know, how vaccines work and how viruses work. The Atlantic posted an article this month highlighting the nine words from the pandemic that most people just <laughs> don't get right. I'm curious about uh, the sort of stuff that you have heard, the jargon that you have heard where you're like, you just don't understand this. Yeah, I, this is a really important topic in general. Um, you know, I think it's uh, important to trust experts. I, I mean, everybody should should be um, able to question, ask for more information. Um, scientists should be able to provide information and, and provide it in a way that's digestible for non-scientists. But just like any other field, you know, experts really need to be trusted in, in making some of these decisions and offering their advice. Um, some of this has to do with the misunderstanding or conflation of terms to mean different things. So the one that I've been um, uh, very uh, confused about is this idea of natural immunity. Um, and the idea that immunity from infection is somehow better because it's natural just simply is, is not true. Uh, there are many types of infection that don't induce good immunity. HIV is a great example. Natural infection does not induce immunity that protects you. In fact, it makes things worse. Um, and so the same may be true here for coronavirus, that there are some differences between immunity following infection and immunity following vaccination. And by the way, the immune response uh, induced by a vaccine is also natural. Your immune system is still natural. Um, there are plenty of other terms, um, including fully vaccinated versus fully protected. Uh, those are some things that we need to distinguish just because you got two doses the vaccine doesn't necessarily mean that you're fully protected and that protection may change over time. Um, things like asymptomatic infections, which we use sort of interchangeably with the idea that the infection wasn't severe enough to get you to the hospital. Um, and asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic may mean one thing for one person and something quite different for another person. So there's been a lot of challenges in effectively communicating some of these scientific ideas not only to non-scientists, but even within the scientific community. And I think this, uh, this article by, by Katie Wu was really a great example of how we need to be very, very clear what we mean when we use terms that can be ambiguous, especially when we're using them outside of our own um, sort of field, if you will. Yeah. Um, it, the one, in reading that article, it reminded me a buddy of mine. Um, you know, the New York Times has this style section where the headlines are generally pithy. And he proposed one that said, you know, so this is assuming a married couple. He got Moderna. She got Pfizer. What happens next? You know, and I think that the fact that we can look at what we've all lived through over the last 18, 19 months and think about these things 
um, because we're not as worried as we were uh, at the start of the pandemic and getting infected because a lot of people are vaccinated, um, which is, I think, good news. So I guess, doctor, what what do you predict will happen uh, over the next few months of this pandemic? It, it, de it definitely feels as if we're slowly coming back to life um, in parts of this country. On the other hand, you know, there's a part of me that worries about another variant. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, I, I do think that we are on the edge of turning a corner, and I think that for a couple of reasons. Um, one, um, we're seeing a reasonably high percentage of people getting vaccinated, and we're seeing um, the mandates um, and, and strong encouragement from uh, private businesses really pushing us towards a higher percentage of people vaccinated, and that's great. Uh, we have a very high percentage of the population over 65 vaccinated in much of the country. So we're going to get there on the vaccines. I think that the, um, the uh, sort of pending approval for the 5 to 11-year-olds is another big hurdle to get another very large number of people vaccinated. Now, these are our kids and kids going to school where there's a lot of intermixing. Um, so I think that that's another thing that will help us turn the corner going into sort of late fall and the holiday season. Um, and then I think we'll start to see a slow tail coming out of this next year. Um, we're going to be able to get boosters where we need to and um, make uh, individuals feel more comfortable about going back out and, and reengaging in the workplace, reengaging socially. So I do think that we're starting to see uh, a light at the end of the tunnel here. We've got a lot of work to do. We shouldn't let our guard down. Um, mainly because of those variants that, that you mentioned. The more the virus is replicating here or around the world, the higher the chance of a new variant coming up that we have to worry about. But so far, these vaccines have done a very good job against variants. They seem to be covering even, even the most concerning variants with some degree of efficacy. So I think we're actually in a pretty good position to really push through um, the end of uh, this year and into next year. Dr. John Wary, thank you so much. Really fascinating discussion. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me.